Hey everyone, Sleepy Reader here. This is uh, my latest Sleepy Vlog. I don't know what number it is. I, for some reason, like to know what number it is when I start. But I forgot to look. Um, I am quite the chocoholic. Today I tried out this, which I've never tried before. I don't even know how to say it. Tough... 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 That's a bad name. But these were actually quite tasty. Um, and they were in the candy section of my grocery store uh, on, at the checkout line. So I grabbed them just because I felt like I'd had everything else before. And at the same grocery store, I bought this. I first saw this stuff at natural food stores. I can't believe it's at my regular grocery store now. Sometimes I hate it and sometimes I love it. It's really strong chocolate and not very sweet. And it also has some other herbs and things they put in it. It's supposed to be a chocolate milk elixir. Um, although not made with milk. <laughs> uh, it's soy free and dairy free. So I don't know what they make. Coconut milk. So it's not coconut free. Um, it's weird. Sometimes I love it and sometimes I hate it. I don't. And, I, and every time I see the bottle, I think it's shampoo. And there's so much chocolate in it that it gets this chocolate scum at the bottom. Anyway, right now I'm actually drinking seltzer water. Um, and. Just the other day I ordered and it came immediately from Amazon, a bit of vinyl. I haven't bought much vinyl lately, but I got the latest Judas Priest album. Um, I didn't even buy their, I don't think I even bought their last two albums. I think I just listened to them on YouTube. But I am going to see them in concert and that kind of made me, I don't know, get more excited. And I heard two, so two songs in advance from it and thought they sounded really good. Um... The last time I saw Judas Priest was in 1990. And now I'm kind of upset that their last of their two original guitars had to leave because of Parkinson's disease. But I've already bought the tickets. Hopefully it'll be a good concert. The warm-up band is Saxon. I don't know a lot about Saxon. I know one, they're one of those British new wave of heavy metal bands. Um, no, no pictures of the band members on here at all. Um, I don't think they want you to think about how old they've gotten, but I've gotten old too. Um, so while I'm just showing you stuff, uh, actually, I also, I wanted to include as part of my sleepy vlog, just a snapshot of what I've been watching lately. So just list off comic book community people who I, whose videos I've watched in basically the past 24 hours or so. So it's not everybody I watch, just sort of a, a slice of what's right now. And uh, the last person from the community I watched was Dr. Von Schilla. And uh, I think talking about his home repairs <laughs> or the, how expensive those are going to be. I watched, um, excuse me, Ghost Critic, uh, Cat Wren Figures, Howler Mouse. I caught two live shows of Howler Mouse, one yesterday afternoon that I found so riveting that <laughs> he was talking about um, <clears throat> A Starman by James Robinson, which he has a lot of affinity for. And I found his talk about it so riveting that I actually postponed leaving my house to go out for a walk with a friend by a few minutes. Um, I watched Silver Planet. I listened, watched to Long Box Review. He had a, sometimes his, uh, I think only sometimes his um, podcast episodes appear on his YouTube channel. So I listened to part of that. It's very long. I'm going to listen to more tomorrow, probably. I caught a couple of ETA Nick um, videos, Guess the Artist, and then when he showed the issue of Creepy, I think, that had all the incredible art in it. I watched Geek Squared who haven't been able to get their comics in a while and finally could. Um, Silver Age Dave, talking about Weight Watchers. Um, what else have anybody... Oh, Johnny DaCosta uh, with his quarter bin haul. That was a lot of fun. Um, also caught yesterday Reader 1717 and The Masked Panther. And uh, some stuff from Devin. What is Devin calling himself right now? He used to be Goose, and now uh, it'll come to me later. 
Uh, I caught some Jared Osborne, some Comic Uno, and Max Washington Songs, who's an honorary member of the community. He leaves lots of comments, even though his videos are musical and not about comics. But very cool. Should be checked out. And um, well, let, let me show you. I, I think it was about a week ago. I picked up these off of a 50% off table at a comic book shop near me. Um, I almost felt guilty getting them at 50% off because my wife follows the owner of the shop, a woman who also um, has kids in our elementary school, um, on Facebook. And I guess she's been posting on Facebook about uh, struggles to get enough business. Um, and unfortunately, I already have a pull list at another sh nearby shop that I like a lot. So I don't really feel like it would be fair to just transfer my pull list, list just just to help out another business. <laughs> my pull list is substantial. Um, anyway, this is a Hellboy the first 20 years, which rather, I guess because there's also an art of Hellboy, but this is supposed to be a celebration of 20 years worth of stuff. But it's a bit odd because most, most of what is in it is from the second 20 years. Um, so there's maybe only 15 pages from the first, the second 10 years of the 20 years, from the first 10 years. And most of it is covers with occasional sketches and special event kinds of things. And then just a few comic book pages. So, I, I mean, I'm really happy to have it, especially at half price, because I think it only cost $20, so I got it for $10. Um, it's a beautiful book. I love to have these books of covers and stuff, but I can't quite figure out like um, he puts in this whole uh, black and white copy of this one short comic, um, but no other. I don't think any other comic book pages or not very many. It's just an it's, it's just kind of an odd set of choices for what for what he shows there, although it's all beautiful art and um Looking at it, I kind of appreciate you can look at Mike Mignola covers and enjoy them, and maybe all of his drawings, enjoy them as representations of interesting things, of fantasy stories, but they also kind of work as um, abstract compositions of black and white or dark and shade um, that kind of, you can take them in with the part of your brain that's not looking for the story or not looking for the representation and just enjoys design or abstraction or what have you. Um, I'm probably not not explaining that as well as I would like to. But anyway, I think he's a master of composition, if you will. Composition and page design. Um, so just this helped me appreciate him even more because I wasn't rushing through to read a story. I was just sitting back and enjoying the art, and I will probably sit back and enjoy the art many more times. Then also from that 50% off table, I grabbed The Magic Twins, which is uh, Alexander Jordorowski um, Humanoids book. I didn't notice till after I bought it that it said Humanoids Kids. So hopefully it'll be something I can read with my daughter. I don't know if it will, if Jordorowski will appeal to my daughter. Um, and so yeah, it's, um, wow, it's really only 48 pages and then there's some extra pages previewing some other thing. It looks like a cross between <laughs> Mobius and Asterix, if you will. <laughs> so um, that's interesting. And then another Jordorowski one, there were a number, of, there was a lot of Jordorowski ones on the table. So it's kind of sad this woman owner must have ordered a lot of humanoids comics or graphic novels and they're not selling that well so she had to put them on the 50 percent off table some of them though were like part two and part three of a series as far as i could tell megalix um was a standalone quite a uh, quite a cover there um on the planet of megalix megalix urban sprawl and technology consume all leaving only a few bastions of nature and a mass of drug-addled citizens. So, yeah, sounds like uh, Portland, Oregon right now. Kind of your, uh, I don't know, I want to say classic European science fiction art-looking stuff. I don't know if that's an accurate description. And then actually today I had to stop by my regular shop, so I only got this for 25% off, but another Humanoids 
one. I just grabbed it. I'm just sort of grabbing a lot of humanoids, and, and I'll have to find time to read them. Um, but I like getting lots of science fiction, um, and I'm curious on the more European take on science fiction. The art here is almost kind of standard, though. It's not like art I'm getting really excited about or anything. But we'll see. Exo by Jerry Frizen and Philippe Scafoni. So I don't know if that's Italian or French or English. Anyway, I'll look into it more later. And today, I've been ordering a lot from In Stock Trade, so I have even more coming. But my first of a recent spate of In Stock Trade orders came today. The, the box, which is a, um, it's a diamond box. So it actually, I had it delivered to my office, and it actually says, what's comic shops on it? I guess it's like, what's up comic shops? I don't know. I don't know why it says that. Um, I remember most of what I ordered is in this order, I think. Um, which is kind of interesting. So I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, as I usually do, and some audiobooks. And one of them was an audiobook about comic book shops. And then I seem to be listening to a lot of um, podcasts from comic book shops or talking with people from comic book shops, talking about comic book shops. Um, what made me think of that? I'm sure I'll get back to that. Uh, oh, and a lot of the comic in the comic book shop ones, like there's one I listened to about challengers. And I guess they maybe interviewed the guy who does the tilting at windmills. This guy who owns uh, Tilting at Windmill, Windmills Columns Online, he does a, um, he, he owns a sh two shops in San Francisco. Anyway, they were talking a lot about, I, I seem to keep hearing about how much stock you want to keep on the shelves. And so for a lot of books that are like back catalog, they keep one copy on the shelf when they sell it. Then they go and reorder another copy. And at Christmas time, I was trying to buy Black Hole by Charles Burns as a present for my friend at work, and I couldn't find it anywhere. And uh, at various shops, they said, oh, we can order it for you, or we usually keep that on the shelf, but I guess we've sold our one copy. And I guess this is where that falls down for comic book shops. It, you can go online, and they always have a copy or almost, you know, way more often than the comic book shop does. This just having one copy. I thought I could find uh, Charles Burns' Black Hole at any good comic book shop, and I couldn't find it at any of the ones nearby. Um, for my friend, because it was like a day before I wanted to give him the present, so I couldn't order it online, I um, had to. F I found a used copy at Powell's Bookstore. Um so now I get the nice shiny new copy. It, it reminded me that uh, I don't think I have my individual copies of this anymore, and I wanted to reread it so I could explain to my friend why I gave it to him. He was like, I'm a little puzzled by this. So I want to reread it. Um, and online from Inside Trades costs, you know, pennies. I assume a lot of you are familiar with Black Hall. If you aren't, check it out sometime. Um, especially if you were a teenager in the 70s or 80s. And then I ordered, oh, I thought this was going to be a hardback. Although, uh, Mo Moomin and the Comet. We have one of these Moomin books, and I liked it a lot, and I read it with my daughter, but I probably liked it more than she did. Um, so I thought I'd get another. Um, I, I think... The Moomin Troll family were a comic strip and then became a series of children's books that are extremely popular in Europe, but not so much in the United States. Um, or maybe it was the other way around. I'm not sure which. And I got a hardback of the Chronicles of Coram from the Michael Moorcock Library from Titan Books. Um, let's see. Is this going to... This is one of those... It's the, the, the binding is okay. Um, I think I'll have to kind of, there you go. I don't know if you can hear that, kind of push it out. But 
I'm afraid to say the paper is this kind of, it's matte, but it, it feels a little closer to uh, newsprint than I would prefer. Um, it doesn't have much heft to it. It feels grainy, like it could deteriorate more easily and probably will yellow more easily. But the art, the art is awesome. The colors are awesome. And I love these Michael Moorcock characters <laughs> since I was a kid. I think I've been reading Michael Moorcock since I was 11. Um, <clears throat> oh, and also tying into the, to the podcast I've been listening to, I listened to an interview with Gary Groth, who edited this book of interviews and discussions with Gil Kane. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Gary Groth, talked about how he and Gary Groth is one of the founder, one of the two founders and editors of the Comics Journal and then Fantagraphics Press. And he talked about how he and Gil Kane were really great friends and went to cons together all the time and spent a lot of time together and talked together every week throughout his life. And they were both basically, <laughs> they were basically the comic book snobs. And so it sounded like in a way other people did not like Gil Kane and did not like Gary Groth. And so they hung out together. <laughs> um, and frankly, I'm not a big fan of comic book snobs of a sort because it, it ultimately comes down to a kind of negativity and always viewing things through a negative, through negative lenses in a way. I mean, yes, you should be critical and yes, you should point to what's good, but you shouldn't be so snotty about what you don't like. Um, in my opinion, that's, that's just me, I guess. Um, and it sounded, it felt to me like in that um, conversation I was hearing on, on the podcast between Gary Groth and the interviewer on the podcast, who's this podcast run by college professors, which is also weird. Um, <clears throat> so that's going to give me a slightly different point of view. And maybe I won't really get that out of these interviews because Gil Kane also loved the art of comics and was you know, pretty devoted to it. Uh, even, you know, though he worked and lived during the period where the pay wasn't that good. or the, And the rights and everything weren't that good. Um, but it may color my reading of this now. Um, but I love Gil Kane art. And that's, hopefully nothing will ever change that. I love, especially all the covers he did for Marvel. And some of the interior work he did. Work he did on Spider-Man. Um, Warlock. Uh... I like some of his DC work too. Anyway, uh, one of the greats. So I'm excited that there's this book. And I guess there's plans, vague plans for two other sort of Gil Kane based books. One of which is kind of his day book, kind of like a diary or thoughts and sketches. I'm not sure. And others are some, these are more conversations in here that he has with like groups of people or where he's interviewing someone. And I guess there's another series of just straightforward interviews with him that they plan to have come out. So that's pretty exciting to me. I guess there are some illustrations in here, so that'll be good. Uh, help me along. One thing that really, really turned me <laughs> against Gil Kane in this interview was uh, Gary Groth said that, you know, here, Gil Kane was all uh, always kind of writing comics for not being more literary and for the writing not to be better. That he thought the art was pretty good, but the writing wasn't that good. And I can see where he's coming from. But then when um, when Will Eisner sort of published one of the first graphic novels and then a series of graphic novels, I guess Gil Kane didn't think much of those either and felt that he was just a third-rate Isaac Bisavis singer, is what, what Gary Groth says and not deserving of praise. Um, and I, Will Eisner is one of my heroes. And, you know, even if, even if he was a second rate, Isaac Pesavis Singer, which I would argue against still, he was out there doing it. He was putting out literary comics and Gil Kane, even when he did his own comics, he did some excellent pulpy kind of comics, not literary. So that's kind of my example of that, looking at everything through a negative lens and everything that I got the impression from that podcast. Um, we'll see. Maybe I'll shift. I'll tell you more after I've read all the Gil Kane interviews. So yeah, that's, 
that's all the stuff I've been picking up. Um, I, a audio book that I've loved, speaking of podcasts and books about it, was called um, Comic Shop, The Real Mavericks, Who Gave Us a New Geek Culture. So I listened to this on an audio book, on Audible, on my commute to work in the past two weeks. And I loved it. I mean, I can't believe that a book like this exists because what it is is very thorough um, journalism type of research on the history of comic book shops. Um, unlike a lot of other books, he m always tells you who his source is. Whenever he can, he gets the other side of the story. He'll say, I uh, here's what this person said and here's what the, the other person's version of the story. Or... I couldn't get the other person's version of the story because they're dead or they're ill or they wouldn't talk to me. So you always, um, it's very thorough and it occasionally repetitive because he always mentions who his source is, even if he's mentioned them already in another chapter. But I was just blown away to have an audiobook that gives me all the details of the history of comic book shops, not comic books, but comic book shops. And it goes into the distribution and all of that. So for anyone as geeky as me about this kind of history stuff, I highly, highly recommend the audiobook or the print book if, um, if you're not into the uh, audiobooks. Um, but I had a pretty good reader. And um, I one thing I learned that really interested me is that the first, according to this book that they could find out, what might have been the first comic book shop was in 1961. And it was a thrift store that put old comic books in plastic bags in the windows. And it was by um, Bell. I forget now what his first name was. But he was the inventor of the comic book bag and had invented them in the very early 60s. But probably took him a while before he sold it. And he was only like 19 and he already owned a thrift store. Um, and then it all kind of slowly grew from there. I, I had thought when I first discovered a comic book store in like 1974 in New York City, I thought that was the only comic book store in the world. <laughs> and But I guess there must have been others. Um, someone at the con I was at said that they had started the first comic book store with Bud Plant in 1968. But that's not quite the picture I get here. And there's a lot on... Phil Suling and the beginning of the direct market and um, a lot on how the um, the old newsstand thing was killing comics economically because of of the mob connections and all the dirty, dirty paperwork, you know, dirty financial stuff that was being done. Um, comic books were being screwed left and right. Um, there's a whole section at the end where he guy goes and just discusses a whole bunch of comic book stores he visited and what they're like, the different things about the comic book stores, um, which was a lot of fun and makes me want to like do a tour of comic book stores around the country. Of course, not a very practical thing unless you're writing a book. But anyway, so yeah, I highly recommend this. And as I said, at the same time, I've been somehow coming across a lot of podcasts about comic book shops. I do find it a little distressing or distressing might not be the word but a little disheartening when they're complaining about their customers and uh, you know maybe it's not a good idea in a public forum to complain because you're complaining about the bad customers but it makes everybody listening kind of feel bad in a way for instance there was one thing when the one of the store owners was complaining about someone who came into his store to buy uh, a con ticket and said, I came to your store to buy this con ticket to support your store. And the guy's like on the podcast, yeah, but that doesn't do us any good because we don't make money off of selling con tickets. Well, how can the con customer know that? So, uh, and judging from the podcaster's conversation, he was kind of down on this customer who was saying, well, I buy digital comics, but I want to support your store, so I'm coming to buy the con tickets here. And I was thinking if you get if you go into a store to buy con tickets because you think you're helping a local re retailer, you don't know you're not helping them. I thought I was helping them when I bought con tickets at my store. Um, you're 
if you have a good experience, even though you're buying digital comics, you might say, oh, look, look at this cool store. I might come back sometime and buy some graphic novels, some hardbacks or some comics for my kids or whatever. So and this is. This is a store that's probably a good store. I mean, they, they do their own podcast and they sound most of the time like pretty cool people. But it strikes me that with, uh, with retail, one little bad experience and you're not going to go back to that store. Why should you? Uh, why should you give money to uh, somebody, especially when there's so many other options? Um, yeah, there are also, and the one I was listening to today on my, my commute home, the same podcast was called Challenger or something. Um, they were kind of talking about pull list and people who don't come in and pick up their pull list. And I do feel very bad for them on that. Someone waits four months. There's no way they can sell those comics if, if that person never comes in and picks, picks their stuff up. Um, but then they were also saying, oh, I don't really like doing pull lists. You know, if only we could just not do a pull list. And I guess that's, Fine to it's the name of the podcast is Contest of Challengers, and the, the title of this is We'll Pay You of this episode is We'll Pay You Four Dollars a Month Not to Shop Here, and it's understandable. I mean, fr- real um, small businesses and retail, it's got to be very frustrating, but I kind of wish I hadn't listened to them complaining about that. Um, one thing that also I Listening to this audiobook about the shops and listening to these podcasts, I've yet to hear anyone talk about something that my comic book shop told me, my comic book shop owner told me. I wonder if he got it wrong, but what he told me is that he has a pie chart sort of of things he has to order to get his 50% discount. And it's like $2,000 worth of Marvel. I probably have the figures wrong. Maybe it was $1,200 worth. I don't know. He actually gave me figures at the time, but this was like a month or two ago that he told me about this. Like $2,000 worth of Marvel, $1,400 worth of DC, and $1,200 worth of Indies. He had to buy these three slices of the pie up to those levels to get his 50% off discount. And he said he was going crazy trying to figure out which Marvels to order because they don't sell very well in his shop. And and he doesn't and there's so many comics and he doesn't know what's going on. And if he doesn't hit that mark, then he um, he's a very small shop. Then he gets a thirty percent discount instead of a fifty percent discount, or maybe it's a thirty five percent discount, um, which greatly reduces his margin for the comics he sells, and would make him want to take even less risks. I would think. I've noticed him taking less and less risks in general. Like I. He used to always have all the image number ones, at least, um, and other number ones. But now now I can't rely on that. I have to order them. I have to have him order them. So I feel like maybe he's going to back away from the whole... He, he started out in back issues, and I think he's found back... It, trades probably are his biggest sellers right now. Another thing that they mentioned a lot in the audiobook about comic book shops, when he... I think every few chapters he would come back to where what it's like in modern comic book shops right now. And he kept having shop dealers say, um, we get a lot more women coming in. Women tend to prefer trades over single issues. Um, so I thought that was interesting and shows us again the kind of confusion over which comics are selling well and and why they stay in print when they appear not to be selling well when we look at the single issue sales. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of talk in this book was about comic book shops as a community. And although I love comics and I love going in comic shops, I don't quite feel them as a community. I don't know about you. Um, yeah, I don't know. In this podcast, where they were talking about, I'm switching subjects, where they were talking about Gil Kane, um, Gary Groth kept referring to, to him as a cartoonist. And I've noticed recently, um, but it's probably not a recent thing, that the alternative underground type people 
like say Noah Van Skyver as opposed to Ethan Van Skyver. Noah Van Skyver being the guy who does alternate um, uh, zine-ish kind of uh, comics and Ethan Van Skyver being the superhero guy. But um, I think of them when I think of the dichotomy between the two kinds of comics, maybe. Um, anyway, people like that, people who would be published by Fantagraphics right now, seem to be called cartoonists. And in the mainstream, the comics professionals seem to be called comics creators or a comic book artist or a comic book writer. And I really draw back at the word cartoonist. And it's one of these things where, at least to my perception, the use of words has changed, you know, kind of like uh, how gay used to mean happy and then it got changed to mean homosexual <laughs> and you can't really use the word gay to mean happy anymore unless you're winking at people as you say it or something and uh you know straight once meant someone who doesn't smoke marijuana or take other drugs now straight means someone who isn't gay and the the, wor the words get appropriated or whatever and i could have sworn i mean i've been looking into comics for uh what, 45 years or so, 46 years, I could have sworn that back in the day, it was bad to be called a cartoonist. A cartoonist was um, someone who did, well, it was bad to be called a cartoonist if you drew comic books, because a car cartoonist was someone who did single panel gag cartoons, or possibly... Uh, did the animation for cartoons on TV for kids. And comic book artists were always, the two words were confused by the general public, but if you were cool or if you appreciated comic books, you wouldn't call them comic book cartoonists. Uh, it was pointed out to me by someone online, well, all the way back to Robert Crumb has always called himself a cartoonist. And when I saw that, I thought, yeah, I can't, I can't deny that, but I don't know, was was Gil Kane calling himself a cartoonist back in 1970 or 1980? Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And so I kind of looked around, and online, some people say, uh, this is one, something from cron.com, I don't know what that is. They say, Cartoonists are rapid-fire idea generators who make political points or tell jokes using only one compelling picture. Comic artists are storytellers who use sequential images to develop characters and plots through comic strips and books. And um, another interesting thing is, you know, coming out of the underground, they started calling comics comics with an X. I always like that one, actually. I think that one's kind of gone, gone by the wayside, but... Um, Wikipedia says a cartoonist, also comic strip creator, is a visual artist who specializes in drawing cartoons. This work is often created for entertainment, political commentary, or advertising. Cartoonists may work in many formats, such as animation, booklets, comic strips, comic books, editorial cartoons, graphic novels, manuals, gag cartoons, blah, 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 goes on and on. Um... And another thing listed, cartoonist, a cartoonist, also comic strip creator, may refer to a person who does most or all of the art duties, and frequently, but not always, implies the artist is also the writer. So I think the current usage amongst the hip people, because the rest of us don't know this, cartoonist means a comic book creator who writes and draws and probably colors and... Um, and letters his own comics and maybe publishes his own comics. And it kind of has a high art connotation now, which I find funny, and I, I just can't accept that somehow. I want sequential artist or comics with an X creator or something like that. Um, do words bother you guys that way? Um, when did this change, or was it always there, like was pointed out to me with Robert Crumb, always called himself a cartoonist? Where Did the Los Bros, Hernandez, Hernandez the uh, Love and Rockets guys, did they consider 
their comic books to actually be cartoons and they're cartoonists? Or, as I suspect, is this something that's only slowly, maybe in the past decade or two, become the hip way to distinguish yourself from the more crass commercial stuff and show that you're one of the insiders of the higher art uh, side of things? I don't know. Um, I just have that feeling. So, um, yeah, because I I swear that when I was a kid, if you call called a comic book artist a cartoonist, it was meant that you didn't understand what comics are. Um, and, you know, maybe some of these indie kind of super indie kind of people don't really tell stories. Maybe they're just kind of doing gags and bits and um, stuff. And maybe in that sense, cartoonist makes sense. But then you get these people who do wild art things that just have a loose connection to comics. Are they cartoonists when they look like surreal paintings or something? I just have trouble with, with the wording. I don't know. My, my own personal flaw, no doubt. So I think that gets off my chest most of what I've been thinking about. Hey, I should do one of my sleepy vlogs. Um, I have had I, I have read less comics lately, although I continue to pile pile them all up at the same ferocious rate. Um, partially because the weather's been fairly good, and I've been going for lots of walks. Um, my family's been very busy, so I've been trying to lose weight. So I've I've been trying to go for longer and longer walks. I use my phone to count my every step. Um, so there's some days where I've stepped um, six miles, and then I want to do six miles the next day, which can be pretty hard to fit in six miles on your average day. Um, but um, So I'll talk to you all later. Bye-bye.